in that same article by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He says, now he's talking about the enemy of God, right? Here you're going to learn three things. The knowledge of God, which is the knowledge of self, right? You're going to learn about the knowledge of the devil, which is the enemy of God. And then you're going to know about the time and what must be done. Very quickly in closing, <coughs> the enemy God is called the deceiver of mankind. Is that right? The Most Honorable Black Muhammad said that as a deceiver, the devil has no equal. He is the professional and the wisest of all deceivers. So the question is, have you and I been deceived? Go ahead. Right? Go ahead. In the scripture, do anybody read the Bible? We do as Muslims, we do read the Bible. Right? As Muslims, we believe in all of the prophets of God. Is that right? And all of the revelations of God. We just believe the Bible has been tampered with. Is that right? It must be reinterpreted so mankind is not snared by the falsehoods that have been added to it. But in 2 Thessalonians, I know Brother Abdul Ali Muhammad, one thing he said years ago, he said that for him personally, 2 Thessalonians was the cornerstone of the Bible because it talks about the coming of God after the workings of Satan. But similarly, it says that it says, uh, who, who uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, how is he going to be revealed? He's been here the whole time. Is that right? How are you going to recognize him? Come on, come on. Now, we're talking about this man, who the, the, man, the son of perdition still who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, he as God, sits in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Come on. A little further down, he says, For the, mix, the mystery of iniquity doth all, does already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall de destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see, the God had to come, is that right? right. To make us aware of, the, of the, the enemy of God that was right in our midst. Come on. We knew he was a bad fella, but we didn't know he, how bad he was, is that right? We knew he was committing some crimes. He might have enslaved a few, right? But he didn't realize he was the literal enemy of God, right? That had deceived the whole world. How do you deceive them with institutions and nations for centuries? Policies and procedures that far exist you and I. But that one had to be made aware and pointed out by the coming of God. In closing, we can't talk about God, and Brother Eric said it, we can't talk about God unless we talk about it with human characteristics. Is that right? We say God is merciful. He's beneficent. The avenger. These are human characteristics, right? right? So it is incumbent upon us, of you and I, if we want to study God, we have to study the, the prophets and messengers of God. Is that right? right? And grow up into his mind. That's why self-improvement study group is so important. Is that right? Because right. it takes us up into the mind of the messengers of God. Mm -hmm. It takes us up into the mind of the, of the honorable man to his far kind. Is that right? And how to overcome all the trials and the difficulties. So it is with, our, with us. We have the ability to, dis, to display in our own characteristics God. Is that right? And to grow and to, and to express them. With that said, we have our brother. The brother that I arguably say fished all of us in. Who attracted us to the word of God uh, in the southwest region. I heard him first on the campus of the University of Houston, and he was up there just spitting fire. And his, his intellectual expression of the teaching of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad attracted me personally, right? He wasn't just talking baby language, but he was talking vision and big things. This is our brother who's not the same brother 20 years ago. Is that right? He's not the same brother maybe even last year or five years, because all of us are growing as we, from stage into stage until we reach our what? Eventual perfection. Is that right? Our brother was actually recently given a name. Is that right? That shows his, his growth and change over the years. So with no further delay, brothers and sisters, let me bring up our brother, your brother, the student, Southwestern Regional Minister of the Nation of Islam, Brother Abdul Halim Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum.
Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the benefit, the merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I'm a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I can never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs and the person of Master Fahd Muhammad, the great Makdi who traveled 9,000 miles to seek and to save that which was lost. So we can find no other people as we search the pages of scripture uh, that uh, more fitting of the description of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the children of Israel than the black man and the black woman of North America. We thank Almighty God for his demonstration of love. He didn't just uh, predict that this day would come. He didn't just predict that he would search for us. He actually did come and he found us. And he found one among us whom we say and can prove in no limit of time is the first begotten of the dead. Not the physical dead. Because if we look throughout the scripture, we know that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Just saying. And the widow's son raised from the dead. So there's a whole lot of dead people getting raised. Then when Jesus was crucified, according to the scripture, in Jerusalem, the dead were seen out walking. So how could he be the first begotten of the dead? Since he was crucified and dead were up walking, he hadn't resurrected himself yet or been resurrected yet, so he couldn't have been the first begotten of the dead. But the first begotten of the dead is symbolic language, meaning a people who are deaf, dumb, and blind to the knowledge of themselves who they are and whose they are. We thank him for finding one from among us, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. For without the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there is no Malcolm X. Without the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there is no Muhammad Ali. Without the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, there is no Imam Warth of Dean Muhammad. We thank Allah for the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but if I live to be a thousand and I'm trying my best. How about you? I can never thank Allah enough for the one who came and rebuilt this work of his father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the one who would not rest and see his father's name written out of history. A man who himself admits to us all that he fell himself away from his father. He turned on his own father. But isn't that really the story of us? We believe, then we disbelieve. Then we believe again, then we disbelieve. Then we, you know what I'm saying? It's, you've had boyfriends, you know how it is. You've had girlfriends, you know how it is. <laughs> but through that man's stripes, through his suffering, through his fall, and his rise again, we all have hope because we could fall and stumble as long as we don't stay there. Get up and go to work. The example of the one I speak of is a man, in my opinion, is a star without equal. A man with impeccable character. A man who is so embodied with love for God and his people and his teacher, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that he would go to death's door three, four times in order to see us where we belong. The man I speak of is our brother, our servant and our friend, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And I greet you once again in green words of peace of assalamu alaikum. My brothers, my sisters, would you do me a Big favor and give those who've gone before me a big round of applause, please. <laughs> well, I knew I was looking for something here. I found you. There you are. Okay. Now, let's go to work. How you feeling? <laughs> I do him fine, giving thanks to Allah over and over again for another opportunity to try to get it right. 
So, brothers and sisters, we want to take up uh, part three and conclude this lecture series called Oh Happy Day. Oh Happy Day. Now, this uh, title of this lecture, again, I'll repeat for those who don't know, comes from the Edwin Hawkins Singer's classic hit, Oh Happy Day, recorded in 1967 at the Ephesians Church of God in Christ in Berkeley, California. The song was released in 1968. It was one of the first gospel songs I remember hearing on the R&B station. Growing up in New York, the WWRL was the name to say, the Big RL, 1600, the Big RL. But that's the first time I ever heard a gospel song during regular program. It reached number two on the weekly billboard charts and number 28 on the year-end charts. In 1970, Edward Hawkins Singers won a Grammy Award in the Best Soul Gospel Performance category for Oh Happy Day. The song is a hymn written by Philip Doddridge, an 18th century Congregationalist minister, educator, and songwriter. Now, the words of the song go like this. I'm not going to sing it, so don't get embarrassed. Sisters, oh, doing, wow. you got to do your like, don't sing. But that, that's why I'm not a Baptist preacher. I can't, I can't sing. I can teach this word from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for sure. <laughs> oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. He taught me how to watch, fight, and pray, fight, and pray, and live rejoicing every, every day. Oh, happy day. So we took up the theme, pretty much the broad theme in our first part, to talk about the song itself, about him washing, washing away our sins. And we found in the scripture where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And in that act of washing the feet of his disciples in the pre-Passover meal, or after the pre-Passover meal that they had before the betrayal, before the trial, before the crucifixion, what he was showing was he was showing humility of how we must serve one another. An example was that if we would serve one another in that wise, they called him Lord, they called him teacher, but yet he bowed down, took a bowl of water, and washed his servant's feet. Now, I know some of our feet stank. Don't stink, they stank. But back then, them people's feet stunk. What am I saying? They were wearing sandals. I want you to think about this now. With y'all pretty toes going. To, they was wearing them sandals. They ain't have no manicures like y'all with the nail tips. They ain't on that. They were walking on streets that were muddy. They were walking behind cows and donkeys and camels and horses, stepping in poo poo. Jesus washed their feet. Now the image you and I have of Jesus is a man with a halo around his head. Sometimes he's holding a lamb. Sometimes his heart is sticking out. He's doing like this. He's looking all like that. He's usually blonde hair, blue eyes. That's the image we've been given of Jesus. Now imagine this one, you know, you can't imagine white people washing your feet. All right, so I'm going to keep that image in your mind just for a moment, then I'm going to disabuse you of that image. But think of white people as you and I in our minds have been taught to worship them. Yes, we have. Our community is a reflection of how we think. And we're sitting around here waiting for somebody to deliver us from evil. We're waiting for hoping that somebody will be elected, put in the White House, put in the governor's mansion, put in the uh, city hall that's going to save us. Well, really, brothers and sisters, we could save ourselves if we would just get up and go to work, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, and do something for self. That's right. That's right. Okay. Y'all don't look happy today. But this is an old happy day. This is a happy day. So, the point I want to make is that he washed, and through serving one another, through humility, through 
our willingness to bow down and lower wing of mercy to our brother and our sister, we would change the community overnight. We have a law in Islam that says that if I have a bowl of soup and my brother has none, he or she has half. What would happen if we were selfless? What would happen if we were no longer selfish? What would happen if we were no longer egotistical? What would happen if we decided that we want to serve? What would happen if we would pray for one another and not pray on one another? What would happen in the black community overnight? It would be an old happy day, wouldn't it? So he washed our sins away. By that act, and then he told his disciples, do what you saw me do. The example I gave you, you do it. And he said, if you do it, you'll be blessed. So why isn't our community blessed? Because we won't serve one another. If we would serve one another, brothers and sisters, and not look to be served, guess what? It'd be an old happy day. But then in part two, the verse says, he taught me how to watch, fight, and pray, and live rejoicing every day. So now, he taught me to watch, fight, and pray. So we talked about the watchman on the wall. We talked about Ezekiel. Son of man, I've made thee a watchman over the house of Israel. The watchman's job is to watch. And in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel, the watchman's job is to watch and when God brings a sword against the land, meaning bringing the enemy against the land, he is to warn the people. But if he doesn't warn the people, the blood of the people is on the watchman's hand. Mm. Mr. Farrakhan has been a faithful watchman, as his, his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, has. He has warned us again and again of the crack cocaine conspiracy, of AIDS being put in our community, in the food deserts that we live in, the police brutality that we face the counterintelligence program, the crucifixion of black leadership, the crucifixion of black male images. He's warned us again and again. And like that great watchman, he called us to stop the killing. He said, if we stop killing one another and unify, that would send them a message to stop killing us. So he went on to stop the killing tour. Then at the end of the Stop the Killing Tour, he asked the sisters permission, can I come back and talk to the brothers? We need to get ourselves together. The sisters said, oh, yeah. Aisha and them said, yeah, uh uh-huh, go ahead. You need talking. You better go, too. That's what she told him. And the minister began on these men's only tour. And that led to the Million Man March, where nearly two million black men came out for a day of peace, not a fight, not an arrest. The mall was cleaner than when we found it when we left. Negroes got together and didn't leave chicken bones and watermelon rinds on the the mall of Washington, D.C. I'm telling you what I heard come out of Marion Barry. May Allah be pleased with our brother, the late mayor, Marion Barry's mouth. And his city, the man that ran his man, I think his name was Mr. Jordan. He, He said straight up, man, the mall was cleaner than when... Y'all got there. What matter of man can call black men together and bloods and crips and gangster disciples? Listen now. Sunni Muslims, Nation of Islam, Morris Science Temple. Y'all ain't hearing me. Kappas, Alphas, huh? Omegas, Phi Beta Sigma. Grew five groove. You name it. They was all there. Right? right? Bloods, right. Crips, East Coast, West Coast, Middle Coast, right? right. Ur- urban, rural. We came from everywhere. Right. It scared the hell out of the white man. Right. That's why he left on a Monday right. and paid our own way. Right. What matter of man is this? Jesus never taught multitudes like that. Oh, happy day. But he taught us to watch. Then we talk about fight. Wait a minute. Jesus taught you how to fight. No, I thought he was the prince of peace. No, he said, don't think that I came to bring peace, but to bring a soul. Don't think that I came to unify. I came to divide you. 
Jesus loved everybody. No, he doesn't. There wouldn't be no judgment if he loved everybody. What have they been teaching us? You want the unadulterated truth? I'm going to give it to you, man. Straight, no chaser. You're just going to have to take it straight to the head in a little shot glass. Y'all ready? All right. He taught us to fight as Muslims for 23 years while the revelation of the Holy Quran was going, was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for 23 years, for 13 of those 23 years in Mecca, he and the followers were under severe persecution and never were allowed to pick up the sword. So for 23, for 13 of the 23 years, and how does the Islamic calendar begin? It begins with the hedra or the fright, the flight of Muhammad to get up out of Mecca on the heels of a death plot. And Christianity does not mark its beginning with the birth of Jesus, because he was born three BC. He wasn't born. I'm just, I'm just going, I'm just telling you. He, that calendar got you us all mixed up. That's why we can't trust anything that they give to us. According to their calculations, Jesus was born in 3 B.C. He was born three years before Christ. Uh, go check it out. You know, is you, what, do you, what do you call the fact check? Go on Google, check, fact check it. Yeah. But I don't want to concentrate on I don't want to major in minor things. But he was given permission to fight because they had intended to extinguish the light of Islam from the Arabian Peninsula. So he was given permission to fight. And when he came back to Mecca in that 23rd year, 22nd year, he came back to make the pilgrimage back to Mecca. He came to Mecca and he didn't, he didn't, he came, they came from three directions, 10,000 deep. And the enemies that had fought him, that ran him out of Mecca, that persecuted him, that went to Medina to try to kill him and wipe out Islam. They were afraid. They knew that they were in for something. He gave mercy to all of them. He gave amnesty to all of them. The first thing he did was have Bilal to climb up on the Kaaba and to call the prayer, call the, make the call of prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then they went in the Kaaba and they cleaned out all the idols. God don't live in that house. This is a house of stone. There's a little black stone there. The reddish brown stone. Brother Fareed went and touched it. Yes, he did. Oh, y'all don't believe me? Yes, he did. Brother Fareed went and touched the stone. And I said, Brother, you ain't kiss it? He said, Well, I didn't, you know. He would have kissed the stone. He would been kissing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because that who is the who that's going to be the stone the whole world circumambulates around in just a few days as you understand the efficacy, the truth of his teaching. It's right and exact and right on time. So, brothers and sisters, oh happy day. Fight and pray. Fight and pray. Fight and pray. Fight. Pray. He taught me how to fight and pray. Watch, fight, and pray. So we done done the watch. We told you about the fighting. And we're going to have to fight today. Not each other. Why don't we try some Dr. Martin Luther King on one another? Why don't we try some nonviolence in the black community for one another? But you want to do it with white folk. Let them let dogs bite you. Let them put fire hose on you, beat you in the head and all that. To what? Sit on a, in, a, in an integrated bathroom? To smell integrated fumes at the airport? To eat at a restaurant? And you may not like what the little waitress is saying. She go back there, she might spit in your food. To go places you not even wanted? Driving while black? Cutting grass while black? Tossing newspapers while black? It, you fill in the blank while black. All of these things we see now through social media. People getting harassed. People calling the police on us for barbecuing while black. And you name it. So you're not wanted. You can't get it through your head. You talk about women being silly for staying with an abusive man. But what about abusive men? Staying with abusive man.
This man done beat the hell out of us. Fired us from the job wrongly. Cut us from the football team. Sat us on the bench on the basketball team. Giving us bad grades. Ruined our lives. Turn you down for a loan. And you still go back to <laughs> on Monday morning. You're going to be right back ahead. How you doing? Then you're going to get in the lunchroom and be, be, hey, how you doing? Hey, well. And even in prison industrial complexes, Brother Patrick was talking about the brothers call the men boss. But, but it's something secret. See, boss is like a secret acronym. I won't repeat it right now. But boss, they call him boss. Yeah, boss. 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 So here we are with all this education. Here we are with $1.5 trillion in consumer power. Here we are. So Michael Kor, Gucci bag, Gucci belt, Alligator shoe, $150 Nike sneakers, Cadillac driving, Mercedes Benz driving, slave. We don't make our own clothes. We don't grow our own food. For the most part, we don't educate our own children. We sitting around here waiting for somebody to take care of us. We living with our woman in Section 8 housing, hoping that the, the landlord or the, the office don't know that we live in there with her because we're not on the lease. Then in the daytime, you see the women and the children running around in the complex. At night, we run around shooting up the place. Come on, brothers. So, fight. But now we want to just talk about these two things and then we can go home. We want to talk about pray, praying and live rejoicing every day. But before I begin, let me um let me talk about that none nothing that I have said comes from me. It comes from the Mahdi, Master Fraud Muhammad. It comes from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. These three great men. See, you can't talk about God. Every time you speak about God, you're talking about God in human form. I know you want God to be a spirit, some formless spirit. But truthfully, brothers and sisters, if you worship anything other than God as man, then you worship in less than man as God because there's nothing in the universe equal to man. Nothing. Man is the crown of God's creation. Man is the only creature that has free will. That means that the essence of God is in each and every one of us, but among us is always one who is supreme. Yeah. Master Fahd Muhammad put it like this. He said, people are strange. They're like fish. Fish move in schools, but always in every school of fish, there's a lead fish. There's always one among us who is supreme. That is that, that lead wire that goes all the way back to the originator, that manifests himself and then speaks through the prophets. They didn't hear no spook voice. They heard a human voice. You can't talk about God being he and him. You can't talk about him being angry. You know, uh, scriptures say, you know, the Lord thy God is a jealous God. Jealousy is, is, is just a human attribute. God getting angry. That's a human attribute. Love and mercy. That's a human attribute. He's trying to tell you all along, but he hid his face from man. Until now. You are the first people in 66 trillion years to know the person and reality of God. You're the first women in mass in 66 trillion years, other than the mothers of those who gave birth to the supreme beings, to know the person and reality of God. Think about that. He bestowed upon the black woman of America 
that great honor. And now you, through his coming, through cleaning up your diet, through cleaning up your mind, you are now producing eggs. And with a cleaned up sperm, meaning a cleaned up egg, now you're giving birth to gods. Your children come out the womb. You can't educate them with these 19th century educational system. Your baby's minds are so fast, they'll take an iPad, they'll take a cell phone, they'll be ordering tickets, they'll be ordering, they'll be ordering pizza and whatnot on your phone. You want know, two years, what is, what is my two-year-old doing with my phone? Pop, pop, can I have your phone? Next thing I know, he's doing like this. He's watching YouTube videos. How'd you get to YouTube, son? trying to teach them two plus two is four, four plus four is eight, eight plus eight is sixteen, sixteen plus sixteen is thirty-two. My babies look at you like, what? That's why you don't want nothing to do with school. You don't see yourself in it. If I stood here and I took a picture of this audience and then I came to you, I said, man, you want to see the picture I took to everybody at the mosque? You say, yeah, I want to see it. And who are you going to look for? You're going to look for yourself. Well, how do we see ourselves in the educational system? We don't. So God has to come and show you that you're the root of all civilization. Then you have the thirst for learning. You say, I'm the, what? I'm the original man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet, God of the universe, God of the universe. You mean all of this belongs to me? Yes. But you can't and I can't approach this universe unless we have reverence for he who brought it into existence. So you cannot have an educational system that is devoid of the knowledge of God. How are you going to study his creation and not pay respect to the creator? We Okay. So Master Fahd Muhammad came, he raised up the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave you Malcolm, gave you Muhammad Ali, gave you uh, many, Naeem Akbar. I mean, you can, all of these luminaries and people that you don't even know were in the nation, touched by the nation. Huh? You'd be surprised. Some of your favorite singing groups, some of your, some of your greatest stars had a, had a brush with the nation of Islam. Hmm? Some you wouldn't even know. Joe Tex, you wouldn't even know that he was, he was a Muslim minister. That's right. you, you wouldn't know that. You said, what, skinny legs and all, man? Yeah. Sonia Sanchez, the great poet. Was Sonia 5X? Huh? A lot of, we just don't know. And when we study the history, we'll know that this brush with Islam has caused many of our great ones to be there. And they're there, and they, and they know, I met them. I've met them, brother and sister. We okay? Yes, I don't want to bore you. <laughs> but I, I want you to be taught well, brother and sister. I don't want you to, to come and spend a few hours with us and then not walk away with something that you didn't know. I don't want these teachings to be trite. Meaning, I'm repeating some stuff you heard before and you know, you're like, mm, yeah, I heard that before. Don't want you to do go away from here like that. I want you thinking about something better than what you thought of when you came here. Because right now, many of us are thinking about our condition. What happened to us yesterday? Think about how we're going to pay the rent tomorrow. Think about right now and what you can do right now for yourself and for your people. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had many great ministers and many great helpers, but the greatest of them all is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, sir. He stayed in the process. Right. See, Malcolm jumped out of the process, and he learned that that devil he was teaching about really was the devil. <laughs> Muhammad Ali jumped out of the process. And wouldn't listen to the honorable like the honorable. See, think about this. The nation has been accused of, well, see, Ali, they want Ali because they wanted to rob him of his money. Think about Ali, the only one that the mafia didn't bother. I want you to think about that. The mafia controlled the boxing game. Muhammad 
Ali Cassius Clay was owned by a syndicate out of Kentucky. See, all gangsters ain't Italian and Sicilian. Gangsters have southern twines. Gangsters are in horse racing. Gangsters are in a bunch of things. Liquor industry, music industry. There's all kind of gangsters now. Politics. Politics. You right about that. That's a re they really in there. So because the son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Herbert Muhammad, Jabba Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with him, took over the management of Muhammad Ali, he made those million dollar purses and he got to keep his money. Because who was going to mess with him? They came to Ali, they said, look, you need to throw this fight or we're going to break your knees. He went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, the apostle, they said, if I don't throw this fight, they're going to break my knees. He said, well, brother, you tell them they got knees too. <laughs> they left him alone. Muhammad Ali was put out of the nation for fighting. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad thought he had more value as a minister than a boxer and put him out because he wanted to go back into the fight game. The Muhammad Ali of 1967 was unbeatable. He could have retired undefeated. If he'd have fought three more years, he would have retired undefeated. There was nobody on the horizon that could have beat that man. Nobody. He was too big, too strong, too quick. He was lightning in a bottle. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Rumble, young man, rumble. But the Muhammad Ali that came back in 1970 that fought Jerry Quarry, Oscar Bonavina, and then lost to Joe Frazier was a man that got hit more than the Muhammad Ali and Cassius Clay ever got hit. You got to see the difference. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was floating like a bug. You couldn't touch him before. Think about it. But then he had to come up with what he called the Russian tank. He was getting hit. The rope of dope and the mirage. Huh? Your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see. The rope of dope and the mirage. But he was getting rocked. And many believe that's what brought on his Parkinson's. See? And wouldn't just wouldn't give it up, man. And went in again for Larry Holmes. Man, I cried that whole fight. It was terrible. So Larry Holmes cried. You're right, brother. He didn't want to beat up his mentor, his hero, but he, he, had, he had a championship to defend. <coughs> so anyway, brothers and sisters, know that. Now, Minister Farrakhan is a unique man. Understand that all the movements of our people who have rise and been destroyed or marginalized, the Nation of Islam is the only one that has come back to reclaim at least a, a portion of its former prominence and it's still going. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I want you to recognize the fact, the brothers and sisters, that these three great men, Master Fahd Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan are very important and what I'm saying isn't my wisdom. What I'm saying is my way of expressing the wisdom that I've learned. Now let's see if I can get through this thing in the next two hours. All right, here we go. <laughs> what separates us, distinguishes us from most and many is supreme wisdom lessons. After teaching the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for three and one half years, Master Fahd Muhammad asked him and others a series of questions. And the answers that they gave, the best of them was from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and that became the, best, the basis of our supreme wisdom lessons. Yes, and so now lesson number two, question answer number 39, asked the question, now tell us, would you hope to live to see that the gods take the devil into hell in the very, in the very near future? His answer was yes. I fast and pray, Allah, in the name of his prophet, W.D. Farad, 
that I will see the hereafter when Allah in his own good time takes the devil off our planet. Now you notice in the lesson the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is calling Master Fahd Muhammad Prophet W.D. Farad. See? He knew who he was the first time he met him. But he was told by Master Fahd Muhammad who else knows that but you? He said, be quiet, it's not time to tell. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said many great things of himself as he began to reveal who he was, more than a messenger. But the closer he got to identifying his identity, the closer it got to his departure. The same goes today with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, brothers and sisters. The same thing goes today. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, he washed our sins away. Oh, happy day. He taught me how to fight, watch, fight, and pray. Fight and pray. Live rejoicing every day. Let's go for this thing. Y'all ready? Okay. So now, why we should pray and live rejoicing every day? I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible so y'all can get, be about your business and prepare yourself for your work week. But I think you have to get some good teaching. Y'all ready? Okay. The message of the black man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, lays out for us. He says, again, the principles of belief in Islam are one God, his prophets, his scriptures, his judgment, his resurrection of the mentally dead. The main principles of action in Islam, keeping up prayer, spending in the cause of truth, fasting, especially during the month of Ramadan, pilgrimage to Mecca, speaking the truth regardless of to whom or what, being clean internally, loving your brother believers as yourself, doing good to all, killing no one whom Allah has not ordered to be killed, setting at liberty the captured believer, worshiping no God but Allah, and fearing no one but Allah. These are the teachings of the prophets. He says the true religion of Allah, God, is Islam, according to the Holy Quran 3 and 18. And the emblem of Islam represents the sun, the moon, and the stars. The meaning is freedom, the sun, justice, the star, and equality, the moon. So, brothers and sisters, no other nation's religion has a sun, moon, and stars as its emblem. No religion is worthwhile. Listen to these words, because I'm going to repeat them later on in this talk. No religion is worthwhile if its roots are not found in the universal order of things. No nation can use the sun, moon, and stars to represent their government or religion, but the nation that owns it, the nation of Islam. We are the sole owners of the earth. It was our fathers who made it. The prayer service of Islam is not equaled by any other religion. Five prayers a day made with the face turned in the direction of the sunrise. Prayer is at sunrise, noon, mid-afternoon, sundown, and before retiring. On awakening during the night, another prayer is made. In fact, two prayers should be said during the night, making a total of seven prayers a day. The Muslim wash and clean all exposed parts of their bodies before prayer early at the gray day of dawn. That's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, why are we talking about praying and rejoicing every day? You see, brothers and sisters, Allah sets forth a law. See? You don't go buy a car. We got brother in the audience. He, he works at a, at a car lot or a car dealership. I won't just call it a car, a car lot. Makes me think Chief Charlie's car lot. I won't think of that. But we have a brother who works at the car wash. But not car wash. Lord. He might work there too. I don't know. The cars do get washed. He works at a car lot, excuse me. And he can tell you that when they sell a new car, they always give you a manual on how to maintain it. See? So God gives you light. Gives me light. And we think that we don't have a manual or instructions on how to live. But we do. Because our bodies are connected to the universe and connected to the earth because we come from it 
and we made it. The universe and us are one. It's just that we are disconnected from it. Y'all don't hear me. Brother Patrick would say, y'all right, ain't with me. Go ahead, brother. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, this is Mr. Farrakhan says that Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a man that taught us to respect the law of Allah God. He was a man that taught us also to respect the laws of man. Why should we respect law? There is no civilization, no nation, no society that is ordered if that society does not have law. And when we have a society that has law and the citizens of that society do not respect that law, then you have a disordered society. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that the first law of the universe is motion. See, a lot of us, let's do something. We got to do something. We got to do something. Yeah, okay, what do you want to do? We got to do something. We want to move out and do what? Here, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, everything that is living is moving. We live in a universe where everything is in motion. Nothing is really standing still. And when you have motion, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us the second law of the universe is that you must have order. You can't just move out. you got to have order. Disorder, Mr. Farrakhan said, is the very opposite of order. Order presupposes obedience to law, rules, and regulations. Once you have motion and no order, then the motion starts tearing itself apart. Without order, then you bring your motion to a stop. Disorder produces the death of a society, the death of a nation, the death of a civilization, and it produces your and my death if our lives, if our life is not ordered. Almighty God Allah is creating life and giving motion to life and all the planets would be would be an unwise God to create the motion which is a law and not protect that motion by bringing the law that gives order to that motion that's a wise God in everything that exists you find a law working and in everything that exists, you find that the success of, a, of that creature is directly due to its obedience to the law under which it is created. Once the creature deviates from the law under which it is created, it starts interfering with its own motion. Then it brings itself to an untimely death. Well, let's look at the human being for a moment. Brother, go to the slide, please. Let's look at the human being for a moment. You may not realize this, but Minister Farrakhan says, but we are created as what is called the microcosm. That whatever you see going on in us, you can read it in the universe for the same God that created us created the universe, according to the restrictive laws of Islam. So now, what I want you to understand, sisters and brothers, is that Allah in our religion orders us to pray at least five times a day. Those five prayers may take us a total of maybe 12 minutes apiece. 60 minutes out of a day. That's all he asked us to do. That's what we're obligated to do. The other prayers are, are super obligatory. But we're asked to do those five. To stop at a certain point and give reverence to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Think about it. I'm getting a little witness bearing going here. Okay. In Message to the Black Man, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, quoting Surah 29, verse 45, says, Recite that which has been revealed to thee of the book and keep up prayer. Surely prayer keeps one away from indecency and evil, and certainly the remembrance of Allah is the greatest force, and Allah knows what you do. So, sisters and brothers, when you get them little thoughts in your head, Take time out and think of Allah instead of following what you think. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, surely the best way to strive to be upright in a sinful world is to pray continuously to the one true God whose proper name is Allah for guidance. As we are generally sinful and easily yield to the temptations, it is only fit to keep up prayer. Allah, the one true God, has blessed us with the universe a sun to shine and brighten up the heavens, giving light for us to see 
warmth enabling us to live and causing vegetation to grow and all life to exist. We reside on a planet through his will. So why should we not pray and continuously thank him for this privilege? See? Pray and live rejoicing every day. Because you know what? You could be right now on the slab at the medical examiner. A lot of people went to bed last night thinking they were going to get up this morning. And the only place they're at right now is at the medical examiner's office. Getting prepared for autopsy on Monday. Y'all didn't hear me. Think about how fragile life is. And how much gratitude we should have for the fact that even if you've got problems, thank God for the problems. Because the universe is full of problems. And if you and I would solve the problems of the universe, we would get a reward. What do you think inventions are? What do you think people get trademarks for, copyrights for? They come up with ideas, and they get paid for them. They invent things, and they get paid for them. They do service for people. They solve problems of hunger. They solve problems of ignorance whether that's a here or abroad. Think about what I'm saying. And for that, they're rewarded with something of value. Y'all, I know this is one of them jump and shout kind of things, but I, I want you to know. So we pray and we live rejoicing every day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said this. He said, no other nation's religion has the sun, moon, and stars as its emblem. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm repeating this. No religion is worthwhile if its roots are not found in the universal order of things. You've got to get out of this spooky kind of religious kind of religiosity that we have that tie us to spookism when Islam is mathematics. Religion is mathematical. Yo. The ten systems of the universal order, Minister Farrakhan says, the ten systems of the universal order, there are nine planets out here revolving around the sun. The nine planets are mastered and controlled by the light of the sun, which keeps the planets in orbit and in order. Put up that slide, brother, for me. As long as the planets obey the law of light and keep within the prescribed limits of the law, the planets function well. There is harmony in universal order. The same thing applies to you and me. Within the human being are nine functioning systems. Skeletal, digestive, lymphatic, muscular, respiratory, endocrine, nervous, circulatory, and reproductive systems. And the tenth system is the brain. Mr. Farrakhan said, do you know that the health of this human body depends on how well these ten systems function in relationship to each other? Anytime you get sick, there's a disorder in the systems of your body. But most of that's tied to our minds. Mr. Farrakhan goes on to say, this brain of ours is like the sun. It is to be lit with knowledge. No, keep the slide up, brother. Go to the next slide, please. So they can see. By this brain being lit with knowledge, then the systems obey the law of light of our knowledge, and we have harmony and order in the function of our bodies. But in the at the very moment our light goes out in the tenth system, our brain, the moment you do not have the kind of knowledge that will allow you to live by the divine law of Almighty God, then because of the darkness of our thoughts and the darkness of our minds, we begin to interfere with the harmonious function of our system. More than 90% of our illness is psychosomatic. Our thinking is making us sick. Y'all, okay. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that this human body is a mathematical creation. And like everything else, it is on time. So when the light goes out up there, you'll find that it doesn't function well. You begin to have problems with your heart. You begin to have problems with the rhythm of your system. For example, when your pulse beat is off, that means your heartbeat is off. 
And when the doctor listens to your pulse, he's listening for the regularity of the beat of your pulse, which tells us whether you're mathematically tuned up. Right. So he takes your pulse. He checks your blood pressure. All these mathematics to know that something is wrong with you and I. There's nothing spooky about that. It's pretty scientific. Consequently, Mr. Farquhar said, you will also start looking for problems in the circulatory system. And that problem in the circulatory system may be indicative of that there is a problem in the nervous system. And when the circulatory system and the nervous system are upset, there's a problem in the digestive system. You ever have the best food in the world set out and you eat and somebody makes you angry and gives you indigestion? How, how is that possible? You had your favorite meal, said a mama then fixed your favorite meal for you, and then somebody, your brother came in and made you mad. And now you got indigestion. The same meal your mama fixed, the same meal you, you love. My mama, man, mama, I'm sure glad you fixed these chicken and dumplings. Ooh, I love these chicken and dumplings, mama. Thank you, mama. And then your brother comes in and says, man, you need to pay me my money, sucker. Man, why you want to mess with me, man? I'm trying to eat, man. Get out of my face, man. I tell you, you better pay me my money. So you start arguing back and forth. Next, you finish your meal, but your stomach's upset. Why? Because your mind was upset. Your nervous system was upset and it affects your digestive system. All of this is tied together. Y'all all right? If you keep going, then there will be a problem in the muscular system, in the skeletal system. And before you know it, we'll start just breaking down, breaking down, breaking down. The motion of life starts beginning to come to a halt because of the dysfunction, disharmony, and disorder in the body. Because something is not functioning according to the law under which it was created. So you have to be taught how to pray to stop from the cares of the world and get some peace in your life. Even if it's for 12 minutes, stop, recalibrate yourself, then put yourself back in motion again. In How to Eat to Live, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, but fasting, as Allah prescribed for us, is to prolong our lives with better health by eating the right food and not eating too frequently. He said, fasting does much for us. A three-day fast will tell a story. You'll feel better. Your body begins to feel lighter and not weighty as it felt when it was filled with food. Your thinking is clearer. How is that? How is that? You know we get what is called the itis. Well, what is the itis? The itis is, is your stomach digesting your food. It pulls blood from the rest of the body, including your brain, to digest this usually heavy meal that we eat. Huh? Think we got I done had what? I done had a big old piece of beef, two chicken legs. Y'all ain't y'all ain't hear me. Some potatoes. I'm so full and now I'm I'm sleepy. I got the itis. That's only because your blood is leaving your brain and going to your stomach to digest your food. Yeah, you get a little sleepy. Of course. You would, because that's the way your body works. Y'all all right? Yes, and then what happens if you keep putting food in there, keep right. putting food in there? You get a little sluggish. Right. You can't move the way you used to, man. I, I wish you would keep count. We come up to Ramadan in May. But I hope during April, man, we will take some days and fast a little bit. You know, just not just three days, man. Take, do, do a nice five-day fast or something. I wonder how many will do that. And I'd like to count the numbers of people, how many days you fasted. You, you could do it anonymously. I don't know how you're going to do it. Just slip me a note or something. I fasted three days. I fasted four days. I fasted five days. Just to see and then tell me the results. You know, I said, man, I ain't fasting. Man, that sounds like starving. I ain't starving, man. <laughs> You'd be amazed how you'll feel at the end of that. I once fasted 40 days. I did feel light. Not only could I tell what kind of shoes, not gonna, could I only hear the insects walking around. I could tell you what kind of sneakers they had on. <laughs> that was a heck of a fast there. Okay. In, in How to Eat to Live, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said again, you will not be sick often if you eat one meal a day. 
And if you eat once every two days, you will not know what sickness feels like. That is if you eat the right food and the right food for thought, thinking. You can be vegan all day long. Fast all you want to. But if your thinking is screwed up, you still going to be messed up because your mind's going to affect your body. Prayer is necessary, brothers and sisters. Yes, sir. The remembrance of Allah is the greatest force. Ah, all right. So look, why, why should we why should we fast and pray? I, and I, those, I'm just giving you a little example. But I want you to think about these scriptures. The coming of the Son of Man. Think about this scripture. Listen to these words in, in Luke. 21, 25 through 26. Listen to these words. It says, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then, we'll, then we will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. But it says here men's hearts would be failing. The Holy Quran in 21 and 1 says, O people, keep your duty to your Lord. Surely the shock of the hour is a grievous thing. Men's hearts failing. Men, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in Fall of America. Listen to his words. How, how true the prophecy of Jesus found in Luke 21, 25, and 26 concerning the present time. We bear witness that the sea and the waves are roaring and that fear is now covering the nations as shown by unusual heart failure that is now occurring among men. These are signs of the end of the present world. The sea and the ocean are heaving up tidal waves to unimaginable heights that man has never witnessed before on earth. This is another plague that is upon the wicked since the Holy Quran teaches that the judgment would be such that the earth itself would act as though a revelation had been revealed to it because of its perfect obedience to the law of Allah on that day. Allah will use the power that is in the earth and in the sea against the world of evil. Did y'all hear that? Allah will use the power that is in the earth and in the sea against the world of evil. The white race thinks that they will have control of the power of the earth, sea, and air. It was prophesied that for a time they would subdue and have the use of the power of the sea and the ocean until he comes whose right it is to rule. The heavens and the earth belong to Allah God. Now it is his time to rule. There's much prophecy concerning the terribleness of the judgment of the wicked. The power that is in the water is in the hands of Allah God to use it against whom he pleases. The earth, wind, rain, snow, ice, and earthquakes are controlled by Allah God. It is a fearful sight to see the display of his power with the forces of nature bowing and submitting to his will. I would warn you that this is now coming into action against the Western world. There will be the destruction of whole fleets at sea. Those which are capable of lying on the ocean and sea bottom will be destroyed, according to the fall of America. We're almost finished, brothers and sisters. Y'all. Men's hearts failing. Put that up, brother. Men's hearts fail. Put that slide up for me. Keep going. There you go. Now, according to the Kinder Rice. Uh, education, uh, Rice University, the, the kinder 
School of uh, Sociology, it says more than 475,000 Harris County renters at flood risk. Are you renting? Are you living in Harris County? You're at flood risk. Now look at all of the headlines from around the country, particularly the Midwest, except for that one that says in Mammoth, this was from California, the snow is so deep that residents must tunnel out. There's a history to that. One newspaper or television station reported that flooding has been tormenting the Midwest and will only get worse this spring, forecasters warn. Another report said that roads, town, and livelihoods are washed away by the Midwest floods. And experts warn Midwest, Midwest floods risks may persist for months. And then the Las Cruces Sun News says, when disaster strikes, will you have a plan? Now, we just went through Harvey two years ago. I don't, I don't know. I know that we would like to forget that it happened. I know that. But are we prepared for the next Harvey? It may not come that way, but it's going to come. Now, think about why you and I are so busy watching March Madness or watching these reality shows or listening to our music or got our earbuds in and we just listen to our own songs and whatnot. Cardi B, we ain't listening, no, we ain't listening, we ain't paying attention to the whole world. And this is happening in the Midwest. So now the breadbasket of America is being flooded out. That means that meat prices go up. Because grain goes up. And to make money, they're going to grow crops and sell them as cash crops to other countries as export because that's how they're going to make their money. So what happens when the price of food goes up? What happens when milk goes so high, bread goes so high, and you have a limited amount of money on your little debit card? What happens to us? You're not going to go hungry, are you? So what happens when you smell me barbecuing some food in my backyard and you hungry? You climbing over my fence. I'm going to have to beat you back with my spatula. It's my hamburger. I'm going to get back. I'm saying that so that I don't have you so frightened that you're paralyzed. What I'm trying to do is to get you motivated to think about buying and storing food and water in your home. So that when, the ne not if, when the next disaster comes, you'll be prepared at least to survive. And if we loved our neighbor as we loved ourselves, we would go to our neighbor and make sure they have enough food to survive. Because if not, you're going to have to feed them. You, you don't think it would happen. But keep watching these natural disasters because they're not natural. They're God made. God is whipping America's backside. And what you have to understand is God is fighting for you. Why is he fighting for you? Because you are his prize. You're the apple of his eye. I know when you and I look in the mirror what we see. But I'm telling you that God came for you. That is the basis of the teachings of the nation of Islam. Whether you believe it or not, God loved you so much, he came himself. He left the holy city of Mecca. He left comfort. And he came here for you. And to prove that he was here, he left a sign. He took a man off the junk pile of Negro dumb. Because they had dumbed us down as Negroes. Negro means dead. He took a man with a third grade education. Taught him the truth. Put him back on the junk pile. And then he began organizing the other pieces of junk. 
shining them up, cleaning them up, changing their lives, dressing our women, making our men be men, standing up. And now, because we want to be men, we're seen as some kind of toxic masculinity. Hell no. This is the only place that teaches that a nation can rise no higher than this woman. This is the only place that teaches that. I'm sorry. You never heard that. If you grew up in the Baptist church all your life, you never seen a woman preaching from the main pulpit. Maybe from down there, but never from the main pulpit because believing what the Bible said, the woman shouldn't be up in the pulpit. Says who? Preacher, she the one that taught your snotty behind when you was a baby. Would you tell Mary, the mother of Jesus, she couldn't come up and say a word to the believers? Are you out your mind? Where'd you get that from? That come from a caveman. Caveman teaches that. But the woman has been there as long as there's been a God. His first creation was not sun, new moon, and stars. His first creation was you. That sounds like a wise God to me. Uh, uh, Were you mad at your woman or something? Not me. I ain't mad at him. I know she might have gave you the blues last night. Well, didn't give you something last night. So you now you, he talking about that woman. Come on, brother. Get that thought out your mind, man. I'm telling you that God, after his own self-creation, before sun, moon, and stars, he had her. Because for six trillion years, he studied himself. Brought himself into existence. Can you imagine the pain, the pain you and I don't know of, of coming to birth? We don't know what that feels like. If we could go back in our mother's womb, what it was to be a sperm swimming with a, a 999,999,999 other sperm, you're the only one that made it. So all your brother and sister sperm died. You're the only one that made it. Now you're lonely. But now you done met this egg. And now this egg, I met this egg. Now I lose my spermness and I become a clotness because now the egg is now formed with the sperm and now it becomes a clot. And now the body, because this foreign object called a sperm is in the body, the body's doing everything it can to reject it. So now I'm fighting for my life. Because the intelligence in the sperm and in the egg is telling me to fight for my life. I attach myself to the uterine wall, even though the acidity of a womb is saying, get out of here. You got to go. But I'm hanging on for dear life. Then I form a head, a big lima bean. Big lima bean head. And then I'm pushing out arms. In legs. Huh? Then my organs are forming. Think about that. You and I don't remember that kind of pain in being born, in forming in the womb. But we went through pain. God, out of his mercy, kept that pain from us. But after he went through that pain in his self-creation, he needed comfort. He needed something so good that it would make him feel better after doing what he had to do to form himself. That's why we know we're from God because that's how he self-created himself and we go through that same process to be born into existence. Let us make man. God made man. He didn't make niggas. White folk made niggas. God made man. But after all of that pain, he said, man, I got to have something. I don't need Tylenol. I don't need Advil. I need something that's going to comfort me. So he, he came up with you. Ooh, what a wise God. I thank God for God. Where, where would we be without pain? We would be without you. So we thank God for pain. Because out of pain came the comfort in you. Man, black woman. Woo. Lord have mercy. It's the only place, this is the only place to teach that. Not that woman you are loose for a shot. No, that's a staple of what we teach. 
Y'all okay? All right, I'm about finished. Now, brothers and sisters, in the end, when men's hearts are failing, it's not, let me tell you what Minister Farrakhan says is going to sustain us in this day. He says, as we look on the horizon and we see all these things that are going on in the world, the destruction that God is bringing about with the natural disasters, some of us may become a little nervous and wonder how we're going to escape. If the minister is talking as strong as he's talking and the enemy wants to come against us, oh, my Lord, what are we going to do? Well, pay attention to these words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said to me, brother, in that day your righteousness will sustain you. I want you to study the meaning of the word sustain. Sustain means to give support or relief to, to supply with sustenance, nourishment, nourish, to keep up, prolong, to support the weight of, as in prop, as to carry or withstand a weight or pressure. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't say your knowledge of all the lessons is going to sustain you, although that will help. He didn't say that your learning of martial arts will sustain you, although that will help. But he did say, your righteousness will sustain you. In the Holy Quran, Surah 30, verses 41 and 42, it says, corruption has appeared on the land and the sea on account of that which men's hands have wrought, that he may make them taste a part of that which they have done so that they may return, say, travel the land, then see what was the end of those most before most of them were polytheists. Polytheists mean you believe in more than one God. My brothers, my sisters, as Muslims, we don't make up prayers. We're given prayers to say. And in all of our prayers, when we're making what's called salat, when we're making our formal prayers, we're given these seven beautiful verses from the opening of the Holy Quran. In fact, your raka, which is a, a unit of prayer, is not recognized unless you include these Seven verses. Now you can recite more after them. But you got to recite El Fatiha, the opening, the door. It says, in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we say, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment or Day of Acquittal. Thee do we serve, thee do we beseech for help. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors, not of those upon whom thy wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. Now, brothers and sisters, as I go to my conclusion, my final conclusion, why do we pray? Mr. Farrakhan says these words, and I thank Allah for Brother Jesse and, and his faithfulness to Minister Farrakhan and putting together these books from the tweet from the tweets answering Minister Farrakhan answering the tweets and the questions uh, on Facebook for him it's called the Teachings 2.0 Teachings 2.0 this is the second volume of them but here Minister Farrakhan is asked a question exactly how and why does prayer work listen to the minister's answer prayer works when the heart of the one who is calling on God is sincere and trusting and believes touching the innermost desires of the human being the God is anxious to fulfill it every creature looks for food finds it so God has created a means of sustenance for every living thing in the same way other creatures are made satisfied by food clothing and shelter so will we be satisfied with the basic necessities of life and further to find and fulfill our purpose in life So, brothers and sisters, we are given El Fatiha. And Jesus' disciples asked and said, Master, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said these words found in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in the ninth through the thirteenth verse. He called it the Lord's Prayer. He said, In this manner, therefore, pray. He didn't say, My Father. He could have, but he didn't. He said, our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let me tell you what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan teaches us. God would never lead you into temptation. But if you look at El Fatiha and our father, both of them kiss. See? You say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, holy be your name, loved be your name, worship be your name, worthy is your name. And the prayer of the Muslim starts off in El Fatiha with Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. Hmm? And El Fatiha says, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of requital. Talk about your kingdom come. You think about the kingdom come, and that's the day of judgment. He's going to bring his kingdom into existence on earth as it is in heaven. The thought that's in God's mind will be manifest on earth. But more importantly, brothers and sisters, when you pray, the thoughts that are in your mind will make your body heal and come to peace. And then you and I will be energized to get up and do what's in our minds. We won't let doubt come in our mind to tell us we can't do something. We'll get up and we'll fulfill our deepest desire. Yes, Sit around here and don't think that you can't be a millionaire. You can be a millionaire. Put God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness and all these things I'll add on to you. You don't have to be a criminal to be a millionaire. That's right. Solve problems. And get rewarded. You say, I don't believe you, minister. I'm struggling. I'm trying to pay my bill. I understand all of that. But birds have nests. Foxes have holes. He said, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Then why are you worrying about it? If God will take care of the birds, the bees, the flowers, and the trees, then you and I are the crown of his creation. Why are we in such condition? Because we've been touched by the blinding touch of Satan, who's deceived the whole world. And has put in your and my mind, I can't. As soon as you get right up to the door, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the door of the heaven will turn around. The gates of paradise, we will turn around. Why? Why? Because someone has dropped the seed of doubt and hypocrisy in your brain. Well, you don't think you can achieve great things. I can't achieve great things. You can do whatever you want to do. Up, you mighty nation. You can accomplish what you will, if you will it. I hope you believe what I'm telling you. Thee do we serve and thee do we beseech for help. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, if you want your daily bread, get up and go get it. If you're asking him for help, he will make a way for you to go and get something to eat. If that's really what you want. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Guide us on the right path. See, sisters and brothers, if we don't have the ability to forgive, what do you owe God? What do I owe God? What do we owe God for letting us get up this morning? For giving you a chance to breathe his air. Did you create the air? To feel the sun on our face. Did we create the sun? You know you got some food cooking somewhere. And if you don't, we're going to give you a bowl of bean soup up in here. So the question is, what did you do to earn any of that? Somehow we, we feel privileged. Like I showed up, so here I am. Don't work like that. God gives it to you whether you deserved it or not. And then he gives you mercy, beneficent, merciful, or rahman, or rahim. They all come from the same root word. But mercy has a different connotation. Mercy is for something that you did and you deserve to get punished for. But he gave you mercy. All right, I'm going to let you go. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom thy wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. 
so akin to God doesn't leave you in temptation, but you don't, you don't want to, don't lead us, don't allow us to fall into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Jesus didn't die to save you from your sins. Jesus is going to be sacrificed to save you from the sins of white people that made you the way you are. Because in truth, brothers and sisters, we can't think of ourselves outside of the colonial box, outside of enslavement. It's very difficult for us to think about that. We romanticize about the pyramids, but even then we had fallen some 43,000 years. We was already fallen. We left signs of our greatness all over the planet, as Brother Kosla is pointing out to you and I. All over the planet. Just a sign, and everywhere he went, including in New Zealand. Yes, See, that woman that's up there standing there, the prime minister, she's a classy woman based upon what happened. But think about this. Who is she? Who are the original people of New Zealand look like? Right. Who are the original people of Australia look like? They look like you and me. That's right. The Fiji Islands look like you and me. The original Chinese look like you and me. The Japanese look like you and me. You're not hearing me. The original Arab don't look like the Arab that Brother Fareed and Sister Lorraine met over there. The original Indian. Right. Not talking about the one in America, the one in the subcontinent of India. Looks like the one from Bangladesh. Right. Everywhere he went, he found us. Everywhere he discovered, he found us. We're all over the planet Earth. And when you and I begin to realize who and what we are, then at that point, we begin to understand why we have to pray and rejoice every day for living in this day. See, you could have been born 100 years ago. You could have been born 100 years from now. Well, right now you're living in the opening chapter of the millennium of the Messiah you and I are actually walking in the light of the Messiah this is the modern day Rome this is the modern day Babylon this is the modern day Egypt this is the modern day Sodom and Gomorrah and you and I are walking through it and we don't even realize that we're walking with Lot we're walking with Abraham, we're walking with Moses, we're walking with Aaron, we're walking with Jesus, we're walking with Paul, we're walking with Muhammad, we're walking with Ali. We don't even re realize that we're walking with the great luminaries, we're walking with David, we're walking with Solomon, we're walking with all of the great ones all rolled up in one. So, if I appear to be happy, <laughs> it's because when Jesus washed, when Farrakhan washed, he washed my sins away by teaching me how to serve others. He taught me how to watch. He taught me how to fight. He taught me how to pray. And he taught me to give praise solely to Allah. And to rejoice every day. Because he is a man that the enemy like most of our black male leaders got prostate cancer. I can, you, can, you can name you can run, run the road down. And in so-called curing him, they gave him three times the amount of radiation seeds that should have been given to him. Their attempt was to kill him. Those radiation seeds burned up his whole insides. He almost died once, twice. Three times. He went through a 16 hour exculpatory operation. This is all public knowledge. I'm not telling you nothing that you don't know. He called us up to his farm 2006. And he, and he was in a tent. I'll tell it now. And he was sitting in a seat in a chair. And we went into this tent and I almost broke down and cried because he was so thin. And he said to us, I've tried everything. I didn't want to go through this operation. I've tried homeopathic and all kind of things. But the doctors tell me I have to get this operation. He went through. Now, this is in late fall, early winter. 
he goes through a 16-hour operation. They take out most of his inside. What's the thought on his mind? He sends for Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey comes in, he cries. The minister wants to know, will you help me promote Savior's Day? Wait a minute, minister, you're just coming out of a 16-hour operation, man. His whole thought was to be with us in Detroit at Ford Field on Savior's Day. And when he came out, he said, you thought you were going to see some weak, decrepit, emaciated Farrakhan. But I'm here to tell you and my enemies. I was like, whoa. So God has spared him. He's 85, be 85 years old. God has spared him. Think about it. And it seemed like, damn, is Farrakhan ever going to leave? When Christ is formed in us? Meaning when we can stand on our own two feet? When we don't need anybody standing over us, tell us what to do, we just do what's right because it's right to do? When that mind that's in Christ Jesus is in us, he can leave and go to the Father and get his healing and get his just reward. So, oh, happy day. He washed my sins away. And how did he do that? By teaching us to serve one another. Love ye one another as he loved us. Do that same thing, brothers and sisters, and watch. We will be all right. But then watch with a crooked, smart deceiver, the hypocrite. Got to watch. Yes, and for the enemy, because he coming. Fight. We can't turn our back. The only song we got in the nation of Islam is we are fighting for Islam and we will surely win with our savior Allah the universal king we're united with our nation and called by his name so let us rise the Muslims what fight all you Muslims fight for your nation and we will all be free fight for your nation fight for your own Freedom, justice, and equality we now must have. 400 years of slaves for devil, lost from our own. So let us rise, ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight all ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight for your nation and we will all be free. Fight for your nation. Fight for your own. The earth belongs to the righteous. Fight for your own. Listen to, listen to the recurring theme in this song. Allah gave you an eye for a national, the sun, the moon, the stars. The best of his creation he's given to you. So let us rise, ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight, oh, you Muslims, fight for your own. Fight for your nation, and we will all be free. Fight for your nation. Fight for your own. So we're going to have to fight. We're going to have to fight. So, but after we start fighting and we get our own, I hope you'll be praying, because I don't want to separate with people that ain't praying. <laughs> I don't. And people who are ungrateful for the life that God has given us. Have gratitude, brothers and sisters. And be grateful that God has given you life and given you an opportunity to get it right. And no matter what you did yesterday, remember, our teaching is, is that God doesn't care what you were when you walked in this door. It doesn't matter what you were. All he cares about is what do you want to be? What did you always want to be? And just be righteous in doing it. Yes, sir. So, brothers and sisters, I thank you for listening to our little talk for the day. Yes, I pray Allah will continue to bless you and your families and everything that you put your hands to from this point forward. I pray Allah will forgive our sins and have mercy on us. And I pray that Allah will cause you and I to prosper and thrive in everything that we touch. And that we will be rewarded if we are the best and neatest worker of all the problems that face us today, he or she who solved the problems should be rewarded. So I thank you, brothers and sisters. I pray that God blesses your heart as he's blessed my heart to be more and more in love with you as Minister Farrakhan has proved himself to love ye one another 
even as I've loved you. So may God bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.